This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to easily and efficiently build and manage your own website. Hi everyone, I'm FlagonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Ultra Moon using only bug-type Pokemon. The rules for this playthrough are in the description below, but in short, in addition to standard Nuzlocke rules, there's no using items in battle, no leveling up past the next Totem Pokemon or Island Kahuna's Ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are pretty well known as being the hardest main games in the franchise, with battles against powerful totems, enemy teams featuring competitively EV trained Pokemon, and the threat of being nuked by destructive Z-moves at any moment, a Nuzlocke of these games is not for the faint of heart. Having only played these games once, I decided that it would be a good idea to take this game on for the second time using one of, if not THE, worst types in the franchise. Fortunately, Gen 7 introduced a few pretty powerful bug-type Pokémon, and the Alola Pokédex is large enough that there's no shortage of encounters. Considering the sheer length of these games, we've got a lot to cover, and there's really no time to waste. Just kidding, there's still a few more seconds I can use for the intro before I lose you all and this video becomes borderline unwatchable. So I'm gonna use those precious seconds to ask you to subscribe to the channel. Random number, percent of viewers aren't subscribed to the channel, and doing so would help me out a ton. I wouldn't be bugging you about it if it wasn't important. Get it? Bugging you? I'm so good at my job. Anyways, let's dive right into my Alolan bug lock. My creepy crawly journey begins with an eye island breeze and the lights down low. As with every other Pokemon game, I'm given my choice of three starters, none of which are creepy or crawly. I decide to go with Poplio, or rather Pooplio, because this will make the early game a little more manageable for reasons I'll explain in a second. This does give my rival Howe the Fire-type Litten, which will be a bit of an issue, since bugs don't like being burned alive. For the question of the day, let me know what your favorite Alolan starter is. Mine is Rowlet by a good margin, but I'm interested to see what the general consensus is. Anyways, after about 15 minutes of unskippable cutscenes, I'm allowed to start catching Pokémon. There are several bug types on Route 1, and regular Nuzlocke rules would dictate that I'm only allowed to catch a single one. But for this challenge, I decided that I'd allow myself to catch all the possible bug types on any given route, even if that meant doubling up. Or in the case of Route 1, quadrupling up. This will make the early game more manageable, which features several mandatory fights and an extremely low level cap that makes getting off of Route 1 with only one Pokémon incredibly difficult, if not nearly impossible depending on the Pokémon. So, with a few one-ball HG captures, my team grows to include Flick the Grubbin, Heimlich the Caterpie, Francis the Ladybaugh, and Rosie the Spinarak. With four team members, I'm able to comfortably split the experience and stay well under the level cap as we plow through the trainer school arc that acts as a fairly well thought out, if not somewhat tedious, tutorial. It culminates with a battle against teacher Emily, who uses the Alolan starter that is super effective to your chosen starter. This is one of the reasons I chose Pooplio, since it means Emily uses Rowlet. The grass flying bird becomes pretty easy to take care of with Heimlich, who has evolved into a beautiful Butterfree and learned Gust. You can imagine that fighting against a Litten with Ember here would be much harder. I mean, I will have to do that when fighting against Howl for the rest of the run, but hopefully I'll have better answers by then. After graduating from the trainer school Summa Come Loudly, I can head to Howoli City, where another encounter awaits. This one's a little weird, because it requires using Island Scan, which is something you can do once a day after you've scanned 10 QR codes into the game using the camera on your very real Nintendo 3DS. If that sounds like complete nonsense, it's because it is. But long story short, Island Scan lets you catch a handful of Pokémon that aren't naturally in the Alolan Pokédex, and a select few of those happen to be Bug-type Pokémon. So, after figuring out how to use my camera, I'm able to catch a Scatterbug named Dot. And with a level up, she evolves into Spewpaw, giving me one more body to throw around and soak up XP as we claw our way through the early game. The next stop is a battle against the Trial Captain Alima. He specializes in normal types and has a Smeargle that will either know Ember, Water Gun, or Lafage, depending on your choice of starter. Which is the second reason why I chose Pooplio. Even without Ember on Smeargle, this fight can be pretty spooky. Stab tackles from Alima's Young Goose are fairly powerful and his ability makes switching out much more dangerous. A crit or two is all that separates my little bugs from death, but with a bit of luck, Heimlich, Dot, and Flick are able to clutch out a deathless victory against the first trial captain. 
Before we head to Verdant Cavern for the first trial, I can catch one last early game encounter from Route 2, a Cutifly. This speedy little gnat is part fairy type, which is always a good typing to have around. Unfortunately, PT Flea is a little too frail to be all that useful now, but once he evolves, he'll be a fine addition to the team. Dot also evolves into Vivalon at the level cap of 12, so with two fully evolved Pokémon, I'm feeling a little better about taking on the first trial. If you're new to the Alolan games, the traditional gym badges in most Pokémon games have been replaced with trials that pit you up against powerful totem Pokémon. These totem Pokémon usually start the battle with a boost to one or more of their stats, and will almost always call other Pokémon to their side, making the trial even harder. In the case of Alima's trial, I have to face off against a totem Alolan Raticate, who gets a defense boost at the start of the battle. I lead with Francis the Ladybug. Thanks to her naive nature, Francis is just barely faster than Alolan Raticate. This is great for two reasons. The first is that it lets her get off a Reflect before Raticate attacks. The second, though, is that this causes Raticate to go for a scary face turn 1 to lower our speed, instead of doing damage. This means that when Raticate calls in his friend, Little Chef, Francis is still sitting at full HP. So on the next turn, I just stay in. And even though Francis has atrocious physical defense, she's able to survive the double up from Bite and Tackle thanks to the Reflect. This means that she can fire off a Brick Break into Rattata and get a quick and dirty one-shot, once again making it a 1v1. Not bad for a Pokémon with 20 base attack. I stay in for another turn and tank a second bite that fortunately doesn't crit or flinch. So Francis is able to hit the chubbier of the two rats with another Brick Break, though with the defense boost and the general increase in stats, he tanks the times 4 super effective move pretty easily. Now that Francis is dead to another hit, I switch to Heimlich. PT Flea would probably be a better switch here, since he actually resists bite, but I accidentally overleveled him during the puzzle section of the trial. Fortunately, Heimlich is still able to wrap this up with a few super effective bug bites, winning us the first trial of the game. I like that Game Freak tried to do something a little different with Gen 7 by replacing the Gym Challenge with the Island Challenge. And while I don't think the execution was flawless, I do hope to see Pokemon games continue to take risks by making changes to their decades-old formula. Of course, some things in life will never change. Gravity will always be a constant, Poppy will always be adorable, Iowa will always be a myth invented by the government for tax purposes, and I will always have corny segues into sponsorship segments. Oh hey, look at that! This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Setting up your own website can be a long and arduous process without the proper tools. Fortunately, with their all-in-one platform, Squarespace streamlines the whole process of creating a website from scratch, making it super simple to quickly design polished websites using their customizable templates. For example, using Squarespace, it took me no time at all to launch my very own website, poppyhg.com, the home of dozens of curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. Let me know down in the comments what Poppy should be for Halloween, and be sure to check out poppyhg.com for seasonal fall updates. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. From here, I get to explore the rest of Melee Melee Island. And by get to, I mean that I have to. It involves a few fairly scary fights that I'm different levels of prepared for. For example, a fight against Soliera and her Furfro has me one critical hit away from losing a Pokémon. There's several dozen of these mini-boss side fights that are all challenging in their own right, but I'm gonna be skipping almost all of them so that this video isn't ridiculously long. Which means it's time for the Grand Trial of Melee Melee Island. Grand Trials are traditional Pokémon battles against the Kahuna of each island that occur after clearing through all the trials on any given island. Melee Melee Island only has one trial, so here we are, facing off against Hala and his fighting types. These fights can be somewhat tricky, but fortunately fighting types are one of the few types that Bug-type Pokémon have a solid matchup into. And that's even more true for PT Flea with his secondary fairy typing. With Draining Kiss, this fight is relatively trivial, since any damage Hala's Pokémon manage to get off can be almost fully recovered on the following turn. 
The only issue is that Makuhito likes to spam Sand Attack. Since PT Flea has a minus special attack nature and a special attack IV of 2, Draining Kiss doesn't really do much damage and also has pretty limited PP. So I don't want to end up missing a bunch of times and running out of PP before Hala's remaining Pokemon go down. I'm able to get around this pretty easily by bringing in Heimlich, putting Makuhita to sleep, and then switching back to PT Flea. But it's certainly more than a little annoying. PT Flea also has a speed IV of 0, which doesn't really matter for this fight, but given that Cutifly and Rabombi's whole thing is that they're supposed to be super fast and at least kinda powerful, this sucks. I've said in the past that natures and IVs don't make a huge difference in most Nuzlocks, but in a game like Ultra Moon, where many of the enemy Pokemon have near-perfect IVs and max EVs, they're a lot more important. Especially for the speed stat, where it's completely binary on whether or not you outspeed. Speed in general is incredibly important in Nuzlocks. But anyways, for now, PT Flea is able to easily win us the Melee Melee Island Grand Trial. With that, it's time to bid farewell to Melee Melee Island and say hello to Akala Island, where more trials await us. How and I decide to head there in style by surfing the waves with Mantine. This is by far one of the best minigames in the series, in part because it's actually pretty fun, but also because it's a way to be able to quickly accrue a large number of battle points without risking my Pokémon in the perils of a battle facility. Battle points, or I guess beach points, can be used to teach my Pokémon move tutor moves, buy vitamins to quickly EV train my Pokémon, and a little bit later, to also purchase some pretty useful items, including leftovers and ability capsules, the latter of which can be used to change the ability of my Pokémon if I choose to. But anyways, other than a handful of mini-boss fights that we'll be skipping, not much happens before it's time to head to Brooklet Hill and take on Lana's trial against a Totem Araquanid. Francis has evolved into Ladian, and Flick has evolved into Chargebug, who now sports a secondary electric typing. This is pretty useful into the water trial, though the fearsome Totem Pokémon does have a held Wakan Berry that halves the damage of an electric type move. So, our first Electroweb does effectively nothing, though the primary idea was to lower Araquanid's speed anyways. Dewpiter comes to the aid of Araquanid, which might seem like it's not a big deal, but Rain Boosted Bubble from a Pokémon with the ability Water Bubble is no laughing matter. With the speed drop from Electroweb, Flick is able to nail Araquanid with a strong spark that ends up getting a paralysis. This instantly pays off as Araquanid falls prey to a full paralysis. So we just end up taking a bubble from Dewpiter, which activates our held Citrus Berry. With our berry consumed, I can now go for a 110 base power Acrobatics, which Flick can learn for some reason. Looking at Chargebug, one could be completely forgiven for thinking that this Pokémon does not have a Flying-type move to hit Bug-types for super effective damage with. Unfortunately, Acrobatics comes just shy of the kill on Araquanid. So, the subsequent Double Bubble spells trouble for Flick, who ends up becoming the first death of the run. R.I.P. Vikavolt, the king that never was. Heimlich is able to come in and finish off the Totem Araquanid as well as his little henchman with a few more hits, so the trial is won, but it really sucks to lose Flick this early in the run. I could definitely think of at least two other Pokémon that I'd rather have sacked instead, but I'll have to get over it. That definitely won't be the only death of the run. With Lana's trial cleared, I can head back into Brooklet Hill to catch a few more bug types. The first is a Dewpiter of my own, who I named Tuck. A timid nature is pretty dog on such a slow Pokémon, but oh well. As we just saw, Araquanid is a really great Pokémon, almost entirely due to Water Bubble, which is a truly phenomenal ability. Much less exciting is the Paris that I also catch from Brooklet Hill, who I name Manny. But even he'll have his moment to shine when it's all said and done. For now though, as we head to Wella Volcano Park to face off against Kiawe for the third trial of the run, it's all tuck time. He's evolved into a Raquinid and ready to kick some ass against Kiawe's Totem Alolan Marowak. With Water Bubble having the damage of Fire-type moves and doubling the power of Water moves, there's not really much he can do. On the first turn, we tank a Flame Wheel before nailing him with a Bubble Beam. This turn is a little frustrating, because if I had just given Tuck a Waturium Z Crystal, we could have just taken out Marowak on turn 1. The reason I didn't do that is because I remember that in my first playthrough of this game, Marowak went for Detect turn 1, and I didn't want to effectively waste a Z-move hitting into that. But since Marowak survives here, he's able to call in support from Salazzle, who can be pretty scary with Toxic and Venishock. So on the next turn, I target her down with a Bubble Beam that gets the one-shot. She does get off of Venishock instead of going for Toxic, which would have activated our held Petra Berry, but thankfully Marowak just detected instead of going for an attack. 
This means that we just have to tank one more Flame Whale before Marowak falls to a second Bubble Beam, winning us the third Island Challenge. That was a bit closer than I was expecting, but given how unpredictable the AI can be in some of these fights, I'll take it. En route to the next trial, I get yet another phenomenal encounter, a Wimpod named Roll. She's obviously borderline useless now, but as my therapist constantly reassures me, good things come in small packages. I also head back to Brooklet Hill at night and catch a Surskit who I name Cornelius. He'll be very useful for the next trial, but he'll need to gain a few levels first, as does the rest of my team. And while training my squad of bugs, I come across a fellow entomologist by the name of Youngster Caleb, who has, would you believe it, a charger bug, the one bug type that we lost. I start by putting him to sleep with Heimlich. Then I switch out to Rosie, who has recently evolved into Ariados. Rosie starts whittling away at Charger Bug with Bug Bites as he just snoozes for a few turns. He wakes up after two Bug Bites and he hits us with a bite that does very little damage. So with a third Bug Bite, he falls into the red and then kills Rosie with an Acrobatics. Yeah, I forgot that Charger Bug could learn Acrobatics. That little side comment from a few minutes ago is what we call setup in the storytelling business. And pointing it out here is what we call meta, or annoying, depending on your tastes. That's a line I try to tell. Anyways, RIP Rosie. You never really got an opportunity to prove your mettle, but I appreciate all your hard work nonetheless. With a new angel in heaven, it's time to head into the lush jungle to face off against the totem Lorantis for Mallow's trial. This Lorantis is notorious for being a massive wall in Nuzlocke's, and can easily sweep entire teams if you aren't prepared. That is, unless you have basically any Bug Flying, Bug Poison, or Poison Flying type Pokemon, of which there are many. All three of these type combinations quad resist Lorantis' Solar Blade, and resist all three of her other attacking moves as well, so it's usually pretty easy to take her out without taking much damage in return. The only thing you have to be careful about is making sure that Lorantis calls Comfey instead of Kecleon. Kecleon has Ancient Power, which would obviously be very bad into a bug flying type Pokemon like Masquerang. Fortunately, as long as you take out at least a third of Lorantis' HP on the first turn, she'll always call Comfy first. Now obviously, Comfey is her own form of annoying, since she can heal Lorantis with Floral Healing. But she'll occasionally do something else, and Lorantis can only use Synthesis five times. Special attackers are better than physical attackers here, since Comfey also likes to boost Lorantis' defense with Flower Shield, but even a Pokemon like Crobat with Crit, Cross, Poison, and Roost can get the job done without much trouble. Cornelius the Masquerain happens to be basically the perfect counter, thanks to Intimidate also lowering Lorantis' attack. So this battle is pretty easily wrapped up. After Lorantis falls, it's just a matter of taking out Comfy with a few air cutters, which wins us the fourth island trial. Immediately after this, P.T. Flea evolves into Ribombi. This would be much more exciting if P.T. Flea wasn't the slowest, weakest Ribombi known to man, but it is what it is. And P.T. Flea actually seems like a freaking god compared to my next encounter, a pincer from Lush Forest who I name Hopper. I know that hyperbole is the name of the game when it comes to YouTube videos, but I truly do not think that I'm exaggerating when I say that this pincer has the worst IVs of any Pokemon I've ever used. Look at this IV spread. That is a grand total of 35 IVs out of a possible 186. This is not your average everyday dog sh**. This is advanced dog sh**. Anyways, from here I can head to Connie Connie City where Olivia's jewelry shop is located. I had originally planned on getting a claw fossil here to revive an Anorith for my team, but when I got there I learned that the claw fossil is an Ultra Sun exclusive. That's a big whoopsie on my part, since a part rock type bug would be pretty great to have on the team. Fortunately, there is still one way to get a claw fossil in Ultra Moon, and that's through treasure hunting missions on Isle Afun in Pokepelago. Unfortunately, you need to upgrade Isle Afun before you can do the mission that pulls fossils, and in order to upgrade an isle, you need to catch a crapload of Pokemon. Catching a crapload of Pokemon kinda goes against Nuzlocke rules, but since I won't be using them in battle, I'm gonna allow it. So, once I have an entire army of bug types in the box, I'm able to upgrade Isle Afun and send my indentured servants to the cold dark mines in hopes of uncovering buried treasure. Wait, am I a bad person? Whatever, doesn't matter. I obviously sped up the time needed to complete each mission with the help of Uncle Jim Tendo, but even so, it actually ended up taking far less time than I was expecting to pull a claw fossil. 
So after a sweet stint of tampering with the order of the natural world, Anerith is brought back from the dead and instantly forced into a life of fighting to the death. Welcome to the team, Molt. This leads me to the hardest fight of the challenge so far, the Akala Island Grand Trial against Olivia. She specializes in rock types, which deals super effective damage to every single one of my Pokemon. The way I see it is that there is basically no way to guarantee this fight deathless with the Pokemon that I have. Olivia's Lycanroc outspeeds all of my Pokemon and threatens with a rock type Z move. We're gonna need a sack here. I lead with Hopper into Olivia's Anorith. By maxing out his attack and speed EVs, I'm able to just barely outspeed Anorith and then take him out with an expert belt boosted rock tomb. The 5% chance to miss that rock tomb was pretty terrifying. I made sure to edge Hopper to almost level 29 since my rules state that the level caps end at the start of the battle. This means the XP from beating Anorith gets Hopper to level 29, where he learns X-Scissor. So, as Olivia sends out Lilip, we're now freely able to one-shot him with our new super effective stab move. Which just leaves Lycanroc, who actually only outspeeds Hopper because his speed IV is so dang low. I go for a Protect, hoping to bait out his Z move, but he ends up just going for Bite. And that means that had I just gone for Bulldoze there, we would have gotten out of this scot free but Olivia could have easily just decided to go for the kill with Continental Crush. The AI is really wonky in these fights, especially with Z moves. On the next turn, I switch to our martyr, Francis. I feel terrible having to sack her here after such a great performance against the Totem Raticate, but sometimes victory requires sacrifice. Lycanroc ends up using Bite again on the switch. A Protect on the next turn to bait Continental Crush reveals that Lycanroc is in fact going for a Rock Tomb, though the Z move would have absolutely killed through Protect anyways. However, this does allow Francis to survive for one more turn, where her Quick Claw actually activates, letting her set up a Reflect. But even so, the Reflect is obviously not enough to stop Lycanroc from eviscerating our sweet little ladybug with a Continental Crash. Talk about overkill. But that went just about as well as it could have, all things considered. Since Lycanroc used up his Z-move murdering Francis, the Reflect is ultimately not particularly meaningful. We have to dodge a crit rock tomb with Tuck either way. But for whatever reason, Lycanroc just uses Bite again, which thankfully does not get the flinch, and then we blast Lycanroc into next week with a Hydro Vortex Z-move. That wins us the second of the Island Grand Trials, and our toughest fight yet. Before heading to the next island, I realized that I actually missed an encounter from earlier. So I backtracked to Route 4 and used the Island Scan to catch a Beedrill. I don't think this Pokemon would have made anything much easier, but it was definitely an oversight to not catch Thumper until now. He'll be useful in a little bit. Speaking of being useful in a little bit, the level cap is finally high enough that Roll can evolve into Galissapod, another one of Alola's phenomenal bug-type Pokemon. Everything about this Pokemon is absolutely terrifying. Just look at it, it looks like it's straight out of a Guillermo del Toro movie. Much less scary, but equally, if not more important, is the Pineco I catch on Route 10, who I name Ada. While not quite as amazing as some of the other Steel types thanks to the power creep of later generations, Fortress is still a pretty phenomenal physical wall, and finally gives me a Pokemon that isn't weak to Rock-type moves. Coulda used him about 5 minutes ago, but I can't be too upset, because Ada joins the team just in time to completely trivialize the Totem Togedemaru that we have to face off against for the 5th Island Challenge. Togedemaru gets a plus 2 boost to his defense, and Ada isn't an amazing attacker, so our bulldozes don't do much despite being 4 times effective. Plus, Togedemaru's ally Skarmory likes to overcomplicate things by using Torment. But with Leftovers and Protect, this fight is borderline unlosable without Togedemaru landing several crits back to back to back. Pretty much any Steel type can do this, though having a Pokemon like Masquerain to start the battle off with an Intimidate makes it all the more easy. So after like 15 minutes or something, the Totem Pokemon falls. And then Skarmory falls soon after, netting us a long, but ultimately very easy victory and completing trial number 5. There's a sizable chunk of content between the 5th and 6th trials, including a fairly scary fight against Alola's other Bug-type specialist, but let's just skip to the fight against the Totem Mimikyu for the final challenge on Ula Ula Island. This Totem Mimikyu is another notorious brick wall when it comes to Nuzlocks. Not only does she get a plus 1 boost to all of her stats, her ability also means that she's almost guaranteed to live a turn longer than she should. Fortunately, Cornelius the Masquerain is pretty solid here. By leading with him, I'm able to get off an Intimidate that brings Mimikyu back down to neutral attack, and then U-turn out to get a safe switch to Ada, 
while also breaking Mimikyu's disguise. But viewer, I really messed up. While clearing through the first section of the trial, I accidentally overleveled Cornelius. In previous Alolan playthroughs, I've allowed myself to overlevel after the start of the trial, but in this challenge, I decided that since I was catching all the bug types on every route so that I could have more encounters, overleveling before the start of the fight against the totem Pokémon wouldn't be allowed. I assumed it would only really matter for the first trial, but here we are. And as much as I'd like to go and change the rules mid-run, my integrity is basically the only thing I have left, so I gotta desperately hold on to it. Unfortunately, this totem challenge ends up being an absolute disaster as a result of this misplay. Without the Intimidate drop, Ada isn't able to wall Mimikyu nearly as well as I would have hoped. Her partner Bayonet also becomes a massive pain in the ass by spreading around burns from Will-O-Wisp and even setting up a curse. So it isn't too long until I have to switch out. I bring in Roll, who has to tank a Shadow Claw and get hit by a Screech from Bayonet. So then I switch back to Ada, who manages to dodge a play rough and ignore a Will-O-Wisp. Then I desperately try to wake up in time to finish off Mimikyu. Even with the Screech miss from Bayonet though, we're taking too much damage. But after some thought, I do see a potential out. By switching back to Roll, the double up from Mimikyu and Bayonet should be enough to activate our emergency exit, which will give me a safe switch into Molt or Tuck, who can finish off Mimikyu. Unfortunately, when I switch, instead of going for an attack, Bayonet goes for Curse. Not only does that mean that Roll's emergency exit doesn't activate and I don't get a free switch, it also means that Bayonet dies, bringing in Mimikyu's second ally, Jellicent, which is very bad. I switch out to Tuck, but he takes far too much damage from a play rough. At the very least, Jellicent just uses Spite. So, if Jellicent keeps on using Spite, we should be able to survive another non-critical hit play rough after Protect and two turns of Leftovers recovery. Tuck does indeed survive a play rough, which lets him fire off a Bubble Beam, but with the boost to her stats, Mimikyu survives in the red. Again, at the very least, Jellicent appears to show mercy and uses Spite instead of taking us out with Nightshade. So next up is a switch to Manny, which is just a horrible Pokemon to have here. Ideally, I could just sacrifice Manny for a safe switch, but Mimikyu will almost certainly use Leech Life to do it, which will cause her to gain back far too much HP as a result. So I switch to Roll, hoping to survive a Leech Life. We do. But then for the first time in the entire damn battle, Jellicent decides to go for Nightshade here, which kills Roll. Amazing. I bring in Molt next. He gets hit by a nasty play rough, but then finally takes out Mimikyu with a Metal Claw. Sadly, Jellicent has a newfound taste for blood, and instead of going for Spite, he again goes for Nightshade, promptly killing Molt. This was terrible. The unpredictability of Mimikyu's partners made what was already a pretty bad mistake of overleveling Cornelius into a damn near run-ending folly. It's a small miracle that we were able to cinch out a victory at all, but losing Galissapod and Armaldo is a massive problem, as they were definitely two of my strongest members. And from here, their deaths caused my run to snowball, which is a term used to describe how one death early in a run can lead to more and more deaths later in the run as a result of having to use riskier and less optimal strategies with your remaining encounters. I limp on for a little while without getting any more deaths, but when I face off against Necrozma Dawn Wings, Tuck goes down to a critical hit Moongeist Beam. Then, in an effort to get the Focus Sash needed to stand even a chance against Ultra Necrozma, Hopper misses a Rock Slide and gets crit by an Air Slash. And then PT Flea falls later in the same battle. All of this would have been much cleaner if I still had Galissapod and Armaldo. I do end up successfully getting the Focus Sash, and actually besting Ultra Necrozma, but at this point my team has been so beaten and broken that I'm feeling super skeptical about my chances at besting the Elite Four. Is it possible? Maybe, but I had a feeling that it would require a tremendous amount of luck, and I ultimately decided that it wasn't worth continuing Attempt 1. So it's all the way back to the start of the game for Attempt 2. If you were wondering why content was so sparse at the end of September, this is why. These games take a ridiculously long time to finish, even if you don't have to restart. But I was determined to give this one more try. Okay, make that two more tries because in attempt two I wasn't well prepared for the Cena fight on Akala Island and her Glaceon completely brutalizes my team. Both Flick and Heimlich go down here, which is not what you want to see right before fighting the Totem Araquanid. So that's an early end to attempt two. 
In attempt three, I'm starting to feel like I've got the hang of things. With a better lead, Cena is no problem, just like in attempt one. I make sure to really pay attention to EVs during this attempt, and do my best to get my Pokémon as strong as possible, as quickly as possible, so that they can stand a better chance against the various threats in the mid-game. Against the Totem Araquanid, for example, New Flick, who happens to be female, is much better prepared to face off against this scary monster. With some special defense EVs from Zinx that I got with battle points, as well as nearly maxed out attack EVs, she's able to take out Araquanid before he can finish her off. That alone already makes this attempt far better than attempt 1, because it'll be great to have Vikavolt for the late game, assuming that New Flick doesn't die a different, horrible death. New Hopper is also pretty bad, but certainly a step up from the dumpster fire pincer from attempt 1. Unfortunately, he's still not fast enough to outspeed Lycanroc though, so once it's time to face Olivia, I need another sacrifice. This time I decide that it's Dot's head on the chopping block. By using Dot instead of Francis, we can actually outspeed Lycanroc and nail him with an Electroweb to lower his speed. This then lets me bring in Cornelius, who now outspeeds and is able to one-shot Lycanroc with a Hydro Vortex. Much cleaner than in Attempt 1. Though, since Lycanroc again started off with a bite, we could have gotten through this death list if we just went for Bulldoze. But oh well. After that, we can fast forward to Blush Mountain, where I evolve Flick into Vikavolt a phenomenal, albeit slow Pokémon that'll put in some good work now that she's alive and well. By farming berries on Route 10, I can move the attack EV she needed for the Totem Araquanid fight into her special attack stat, which will be far more useful going forward. Oh, and while it doesn't really matter, since he won't be contributing much to the rest of the challenge, Rosie the Ariados also doesn't die to that random trainer, so he's around too. Anyways, that gets us back to the fight against Totem Mimikyu, where it all went wrong in Attempt 1. Against all odds, I manage to avoid shooting myself in the foot, and Cornelius stays below the level cap. So, as we face off against Mimikyu, Cornelius is able to instantly lower her attack with an Intimidate. She then handily tanks a Play Rough, letting her U-turn to break Mimikyu's disguise, and bring in new Ada. The genders are all swapped around for this attempt, but I figured that it'd be a little less confusing to just keep everyone's names the same. With Mimikyu nerfed by Intimidate, it's much easier to deal with her. It also helps that Bayonet misses a Will-O-Wisp and then seems to kind of just give up on hitting another one. But just like before, Ada knows rest and is holding a Chesto Berry just in case. Mimikyu actually lands a crit at one point, so we have to switch out as she hangs on with just a little bit of HP. Not to belabor the whole all my Pokemon suck thing, but Ada here has a minus attack nature and four attack IVs. But anyways, Roll comes in on a Shadow Claw and a Will-O-Wisp from Bayonet. I don't really care about the burn though, because at such low HP, a Priority Sucker Punch is still more than enough to finish off Mimikyu. Bayonet then decides to speed things along by using Curse to take out half of his HP. The Curse and the burn damage are adding up, though a Citrus Berry gives Roll a huge chunk of her HP back. Still though, I decide it's probably best to switch to Molt, who can't be crit thanks to his Battle Armor ability. After tanking a feint attack on the switch, a single rock tomb is enough to finish off Bayonet, winning us the battle and finishing the 6th island challenge completely deathless. With that, Molta's made it to the level cap that's high enough for him to finally evolve into Armaldo. Things are looking much more promising than they did in attempt 1. Up next is the Team Skull stuff in Poe Town, all of which is super easy with the exception of the fight against Guzma. Fortunately, he can be cheesed pretty hard. His lead Galissapod only knows First Impression, Sucker Punch, and Razor Shell. First Impression only works on the first turn the Pokémon is out on the field, Sucker Punch only works if your opponent is using an attacking move, and a Razor Shell is conveniently ineffective against Manny the Parasect with Dry Skin. So it's pretty trivial to completely stall Galissapod out of useful moves and then set up on him as he desperately just tries to use First Impression. I end up using this strategy to beat Guzma all three times that we have to fight him. But anyways, next up is the third Grand Island trial against Nanu. He has Dark-type Pokémon though, so once again our bug types are looking pretty solid here. He leads with Sableye, and I lead with the new and improved PT Fleet. She still has a minus special attack nature, but her special attack and speed IVs are much better this go around. PT is great for this fight because she has the ability Shield Dust, which prevents the additional effects of moves that hit her. This means that Fake Out doesn't cause a flinch letting her very safely kill Nanu's Sableye and Alolan Persian with two Dazzling Gleams. Nanu's last Pokémon is Krokrok, who with max speed EVs does manage to outspeed PT. So I just switch to Tuck, who gets hit by a pretty annoying Swagger. 
This means that I need to switch again, this time to Roll, who shrugs off a soft crunch. And then, with a priority first impression, we easily one-shot Krokorok, definitively beating Nanu, and completing the Ula Ula Grand Island Challenge. And so begins the interminable raid of Aether Paradise that will eventually get us to the climax of this game's story. There are a handful of relatively tricky fights here, but as with almost all of the side boss fights, we're gonna skip them. I do gotta briefly mention the fight against Lusamine, which is pretty bonkers. While the AI in many battles can be a little unpredictable, the Lusamine AI takes this to a completely different level. Her move choices seem to be randomly determined by a toddler mashing different colored buttons. It's complete nonsense, which makes planning out this fight an absolute fool's errand. Stupid random AI is objectively more terrifying than smart predictable AI, because with the former, you have no idea what to expect on any given turn. For this reason, and because this game is exhausting, I decided to take the cheapest way out imaginable. A Quiver Dance Sweep with Heimlich the Butterfree. A combination of Quiver Dance, Sleep Powder, and Roost means that it is almost completely safe to set up against Lusamine's lead Clefable, who can't kill Heimlich from full HP. In order for this to go poorly, Lusamine would need to get early wake-ups and multiple crits in a row, which is tremendously unlikely. After successfully setting up my little butterfly, Air Slashes, which never miss thanks to Heimlich's Compound Eyes ability, sweep through Lusamine's entire team. I don't feel great about this, but I did have to use Quiver Dance and a Bug Lock at least once, right? Anyways, next up is the seventh island trial in Vast Pawnee Canyon, which pits us up against the Totem Kamo'o, who has an Omni Boost to all of his stats. Fortunately, I once again did not overlevel Cornelius, so she's able to instantly bring the Noisy Dragon back down to neutral attack. Cornelius is also safe to tank at least one Stabless Thunder Punch, which lets her hit Kamo'o hard with a Flying-type Z-move. Paralysis into full para from that Thunder Punch would be terrible here, but fortunately it doesn't happen. Supersonic Strike barely does 50% to Kamo'o thanks to the boosts, but the most important thing is that it does enough damage for Kamo'o to call in Caesar instead of Noivern. Caesar and Kamo'o are both walled reasonably well by Ada, who comes in on the next turn. Sure, Drain Punch still does neutral damage to Ada, but Kamo'o doesn't actually have any attack EVs, so it's not too terrible. This lets Ada pull off the oldest and most divisive play in the book, a classic Toxic Stall. And by golly gosh does she pull it off with aplomb. A few turns later and the seventh Totem Pokemon has succumbed to our Bagworm's Venom. Then, after a few more turns, Tuck is able to snipe Caesar with a handful of Scalds, completing our first island trial on Pawnee Island. On the other side of the Totem's Den lies the Altar of the Mooney, which is where we'll be entering Ultra Space and taking on one of the Pokemon franchise's most infamous boss battles. But before that, I do have to face off against Necrozma Dawnwings. As a reminder, this is where I lost Tuck in Attempt 1. But now that Roll is still alive, I have a slightly better answer into this fight. Since Necrozma Dawnwings is Psychic Ghost-type, they take quadruple damage from Dark-type moves, though that is somewhat reduced by their Prism Armor ability. Still, Sucker Punch should be a two-hit kill. And by finally being able to farm Charty Berries from the berry trees in Pawnee Wilds, Roll should be able to survive any attack Necrozma goes for. They end up just going for Moonguy's Beam, which funnily enough has the built-in Mold Breaker ability, meaning that Roll's Emergency Exit doesn't activate. This means that Roll can stay in and finish off Necrozma with one more Sucker Punch. That was a little scary because Necrozma does have Recover, which would have caused Sucker Punch to fail and let them heal for free. But fortunately, they seem to just want to go for the kill. Or maybe their move choice is random. I don't know. Best not to question a good thing, I guess. With that, it's time to take an interdimensional field trip to Ultra Megalopolis, where Ultra Necrozma will be waiting. This Pokemon is the absolute stuff of nightmares. A Psychic Dragon type at level 60 with dual attack stats high enough to make even the bulkiest of walls sh <laughs> themselves sideways. Add an Omni Boost for good measure, and you've got a Pokemon that can outspeed and one-shot the better part of the entire Alola Pokedex. Power Gem alone cleanly one-shots my entire team, other than Atta with Sturdy, and Ultra Necrozma's signature move Photon Geyser straight up ignores abilities, so high rolls of that move will kill Atta in one shot anyways. By my estimation, the only way to really win this fight with my current encounters, other than hoping for like a Quick Claw activation or something, is to rely on the Focus Sash. 
The frustrating thing is that the only focus sash I can get at this point in the game is by beating dancer Julia in Pawnee Wilds, who has all four forms of Oricorio, each with a held focus sash. This is an incredibly annoying fight, since almost all of my Pokémon are weak to flying type moves, and Julia loves to spam teeter dance like a 12 year old in Twitch chat saying based. This battle also starts super poorly as her first Oricorio manages to flinch Molt with Air Slash two times in a row. That's incredibly tilting, but with some careful maneuvering, I managed to win this fight deathless a short 17 minutes later. So back to Ultra Megalopolis and Ultra Necrozma. The plan is simple. At level 50, Tuck learns Mirror Coat, which is a move that reflects a foe's special move at double the power. By giving Tuck a Focus Dash, she should be able to survive an attack from Ultra Necrozma and kill them in return. The only issue with this plan is that Ultra Necrozma has one physical attack, Smart Strike, that would cause Mirror Coat to fail, which would be very, very bad. There's literally no reason for Ultra Necrozma to use Smart Strike, since it is the only attack that doesn't kill Tuck, but who knows, right? Maybe the AI is random. Maybe Arceus himself is laughing from heaven at my plan and just wants to see me suffer. As I go to click Mirror Coat, I take the largest breath I've ever taken and silently pray. Well, that is a freaking relief. Good job, Tuck. Way to go. You basically single-handedly saved the world. And the multiverse. Or whatever. That effectively concludes the major storyline at the center of Ultra Moon. Which means that, like in most games, I just have to sorta of awkwardly go back and wrap up the remaining island trials. Mina's trial in Seafolk Village is next. But before fighting the totem Pokémon, I have to first fight Mina, and then fly all over Alola to challenge four of the previous trial captains in Kahunas. In Ultra Moon, the four that I fight are Alima, Lana, Kiawe, and Nanu. It's a cool way to tie the entire journey together in a nice neat little bow at the very end, much like how the gym leaders in black and white show up to stop the Seven Sages, but man is it a lot of mini boss fights. With some careful planning, they aren't too difficult, so let's just fast forward to the fight against the final totem Pokémon of the run, Rabombi. Against this final threat, we're going with Plan B. It's Thumper the Beedrill's time to shine. Rabombi gets plus two to all her stats, but even so, that's not extremely threatening to our part poison bug type, who is also deceptively bulky on the special side. Rabombi wastes her first turn going for a greedy quiver dance, which lets Thumper nail her with a nasty poison type Z move. With the defense boosts and a fair share of defensive investment, Rabombi does hang on in the yellow. Then she calls Blissey in as an ally. But at this point, it's already over. Rabombi can hit Thumper with a Bug Buzz, but even at plus three, a crit's not killing, meaning that we can just finish off the Fearsome Totem Pokemon with one more Poison Jab. Blissey was just going for a Heal Pulse, which now fails. So after another Poison Jab that cleanly one-shots Blissey, we've won the eighth and final Island Trial. That just leaves one last Grand Trial against the Kahuna of Pawnee Island, Hapu who's in Alola on vacation from the New Horizons village that you've been neglecting for the last 10 months. You should really go and check up on them, it's an absolute dystopia over there. Weeds have grown over every square inch of town, the insects in the museum have broken loose and ravaged the town's food supply, and Mortan Isabel has become a violent dictator, and the villagers have taken to cannibalism and killed Tom Nook. Anyways, Hapu is super easy, barely an inconvenience. Her level cap is also lower than the Totem Rabombi, which is why we were at level 54 instead of 55 for that fight. Apu's lead Golurk goes down in one shot to a Grass Z move from Flick. And then Mudsdale comes in second. He too ends up going down to a one shot, this time to a regular Ol Energy Ball. We end up critting there, which absolutely mattered, but Mudsdale was never going to one shot Flick anyways, so it really just saves us a turn. Third is Gastrodon and I'm sure you can use some critical thinking to figure out what happens to this slow water ground type. Last is my beautiful boy Flygon, but Hapu has gone in the bold direction of making her Flygon special, so it is very safe to switch to PT Flea, who's immune to Dragon Pulse. Then she just needs to tank a resisted Earth Power before a Dazzling Gleam gets a clean one-shot, winning us what might be the easiest of the Grand Trials yet. Then again, other than Olivia, they have all been super easy. Who would have thought that bug types would have such great matchups into three of the four island kahunas? Well, with the island challenge wrapped up, it means that my next and final stop is Mount Lanakila, where the newly formed Pokemon League awaits at the summit. On the way up, there are some pretty challenging fights, culminating in a very difficult double battle fight against these two random trainers. 
For the life of me, I couldn't crack a way to reliably beat this combo, especially because Glalie outspeeds Hopper the Pinsir by just one point and threatens with really scary blizzards. I was super worried that a bit of bad RNG could result in losing a Pokemon here. But then I realized that if I only have one Pokemon in my party, I can just walk past double battles without fighting them. So here's my final team, leveled up to the level cap of 57 to match the aces of each of the Elite Four members. All my Pokemon are edged to nearly level 58, so that we'll hopefully gain a few levels before it's time to face the Champions Pokemon that are all at level 58 to 60. I'm really surprised that in this attempt, there's only been one death all the way back against Olivia. But this is definitely one of the hardest Elite Fours in any Pokemon game, so I'm gonna need to play my heart out if I want to keep that death counter at 1. Let's see if we've got what it takes. First up is Acerola and her ghost types. She leads with Bayonet and I lead with Ada. Bayonet starts off hot by missing a Screech as we set up Stealth Rocks. Bayonet then goes for a Shadow Claw before Ada uses a slow Volt Switch to get a completely safe switch into Roll. I have no idea why Fortress learns Volt Switch, but it's incredible for pivoting. With Roll safely in, Bayonet goes for a pretty hard Shadow Claw as we set up a Swords Dance. Then I start spamming Sucker Punch, which is super effective against Acerola's Ghosts. On the first turn it fails because Bayonet goes for Screech to lower our defense, but the second one connects and cleanly one-shots Acerola's Possessed Doll. Delmize is second, and thanks to the Stealth Rock chip, it's now a very favorable roll for us to kill them in one shot. We do indeed get the roll, which leaves Acerola with just three Pokemon left. Third is Frostlass. Unfortunately, a Sucker Punch fails as she goes for Confuse Ray. I was really hoping that she'd just attack. A Held Person Berry gives us another shot on the next turn, but Frostlass once again goes for Confuse Ray, which this time doesn't get healed. I could have just gone for Liquidation on that first turn, which would have gotten the kill, but I didn't want to risk a critical hit Shadow Ball, because Roll is incredibly important for a few more matchups later on. A potential sweep with Roll is over, so it's off to her Bug Water sister Tuck on a Shadow Ball. Leftovers and making sure to protect for a turn gives us a lot more HP to deal with, though a crit or a special defense drop would still be pretty bad. As would hitting myself in confusion from Confuse Ray, which happens instantly. Oh look, and there's the special defense drop. Fortunately, Tuck breaks through confusion on the second turn and knocks out Frostlass with a single liquidation. That brings in Palisand fourth. So I switch to Flick as Palisand gets greedy and goes for a nonsensical iron defense. This means that we can outspeed and eviscerate the Spooky Sandcastle with a Bloom Doom Z move. So last, and honestly least, is Driftblim. She outspeeds and sets up an Amnesia, which means that our Thunderbolt only brings her into the yellow. But it does get the full paralysis, which means that Acerola wastes her next turn using a full heal, letting Flick finish off Driftblim with a second Thunderbolt. That's the easiest of the Elite Four members defeated. Second is Molain, who specializes in Steel types. His team is pretty tricky, but definitely more manageable than the next two Elite Four members. He leads with Klefki, and I lead with Flick. Anyone else would be susceptible to priority prankster thunder waves. Klefki ends up just going for relatively light damage with Flash Cannon, which is really fortunate because if he had set up spikes, this would have gotten a little bit harder. I originally planned to have Rapid Spin on Ada specifically for this, but ultimately I forgot. Never punish though, Flick takes out Klefki with two Thunderbolts. Second is Molain's ace, his Alolan Doug trio. The best he can do to Flick is Sucker Punch, which is enough to bring Flick into Citrus Berry range before we retaliate with a fairly strong energy ball. I rationalize that Doug trio will keep going for Sucker Punch, so I just spam agility for a few turns until he runs out of all five Sucker Punch PP. With the agility boost, Flick is able to outspeed Doug trio once he's no longer using Sucker Punch, letting us take him out before he gets off another attack. Third is Bisharp, so I just hit him with a hard Volt Switch and bring in Roll. Bisharp just goes for Metal Sound, meaning that it was totally safe to keep Flick in there. But oh well. Molain then hard switches to Magnazone, who shrugs off a first impression. So I switch back to Flick on a resisted Thunderbolt. Flick should now bait Tri-Attack, which gives me a semi-safe switch into Hopper, so long as Magnazone doesn't get the 10% chance of a status affliction. Thankfully, Hopper lucks out, and he's able to take out Magnazone with the ground-type Z-move Tectonic Rage. That might seem like overkill, but Magnazone has max defense EVs, so it was the only way to guarantee a kill. Fourth is Metagross, which may as well be Molain's actual ace. I start by switching to Ada on a Meteor Mash that generously misses. Hammer Arms do decent damage on the subsequent turns, but so do our follow-up paybacks. 
Plus, we have the benefit of Leftovers Recovery, which, as usual, can be doubled by going for Protect. After a few Hammer Arms, Metagross has lowered their speed low enough that we're actually outspeeding them, and therefore Paybacks are doing much less damage. So, after another round of Protect and Leftovers Recovery, I Volt Switch out for the slightest bit of chip, bringing in Tuck, who shrugs off a Hammer Arm like it's nothing. Then, a single Liquidation finishes off Molain's Pseudo Legendary. All that's left is Bisharp, who yet again just goes for a metal sound for some reason, and then gets knocked out by a liquidation. That wins us the battle against the second Elite Four member. But now things get interesting, because next up is Kahili and her big scary birds. Birds are notoriously not very nice to bugs, so this is certainly a bit of a problem. But I do have a plan. It starts by leading with Molt and immediately killing her nationalistic braviary with a rock slide. This was a little scary since Rock Slide can obviously miss, but fortunately we dodge that 10% chance. Mandibuzz comes in second, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Mandibuzz coming in is huge because despite having Brave Bird, her attack stat is so low that she really doesn't threaten with massive damage. At least not when she's hitting for neutral damage. So I start by switching into Ada, who annoyingly gets hit by a flatter, but that's fine as long as I don't hit myself in confusion in perpetuity. Mandibuzz then goes for a Brave Bird that only does a lot of damage because it crits. Ada then breaks through Confusion and goes for Volt Switch, which gives me a completely safe switch to Flick, which is checkmate for Bird Lady. Mandibuzz goes for Flatter, which very generously gives Flick a special defense boost before a Lumberry cures the Confusion. And then our follow-up Agility ensures that Flick will outspeed all of Kahili's Pokémon. Vikavolt is actually strong enough that Thunderbolts would have killed all of Kahili's Pokemon even without the special attack boost from Flatter, but it's nice that Mandibuzz decided to help us out here anyways. Kahili's last Pokemon, Halucha, is actually still faster than Flick, so I did lie there, but he's not doing nearly enough damage to Flick, who promptly KOs him with one last Thunderbolt, winning us what could have been a pretty terrifying battle. Thank goodness I didn't lose Vikavolt this attempt, huh? The final Elite Four member is a familiar face. She's the only person who was able to take out one of my Pokémon this entire run. Of all the trainers to have a rematch with, it's pretty unfortunate that it ends up being Olivia and her rock types, but here we are. She starts with Armaldo, and I lead with Hopper. We've definitely seen this matchup before, and this time, in order to ensure the one-shot, I just take out Armaldo with a Continental Crush Z-move. There's a bit of poetic justice here using Olivia's own Z-move against her. Feels good. Second is Gigalith, and now it's time to get cheeky. I start with a Protect to stall out one of Gigalith's five Stone Edges. The price is a small bit of Sandstorm Chip. But then I switch to Ada, who once again comes in on an attack that misses. And then from here, we can do a bit of stalling. But instead of just stalling Gigalith out of his Stone Edge PP, with a combination of Protect, Rest, and Iron Defense, I can pretty easily stall Gigalith out of all of his PP. It takes a really long time, since Bulldoze has 20 PP and Iron Head has 15, so we'll skip a few turns here. But as Gigalith uses his very last Bulldoze PP, I can Volt Switch out and bring Hopper back in. With Gigalith fully out of PP and having to resort to using Struggle, it's completely safe to set up a few Swords Dances. But just to make sure that I counted right, I go for a Protect first, which ends up being a huge mistake because Olivia actually switches out meaning that my Protect fails, and I've completely squandered the chance to get off a free Swords Dance. Olivia brings in Lycanroc, who has been re-EV trained to be defensively bulky instead of speedy. The benefit of this is that I can outspeed him, but the downside is that a superpower won't kill. So instead I just have to go back to Ada and stall out this moron too. At the very least, a Protect from Hopper before switching successfully wastes Lycanroc's Z-move. But because of the damage through Protect, Pinsir is too low of HP to get away with setting up, even against a Pokémon using Struggle. So all I do is stall Lycanroc out of Stone Edge PP. And then after getting back to a comfortable amount of HP with Rest, after Lycanroc manages to crit two of his Stone Edges, I slow Volt Switch out to Tuck. We have to take a bit of damage from a Rock Climb on the next turn, but then a Liquidation finishes off Lycanroc. Third is Probopass. She sets up a Sandstorm as a Liquidation brings her into the red. Tuck takes a bit of Sandstorm Chip, and then Olivia uses a Full Restore to bring her Magnetic Monster back to full HP. But then our second follow-up Liquidation crits and brings Probopass down to her Sturdy. After another tick of Sandstorm Chip, Probopass goes for a Power Gem, which does very little thanks to our held Charty Berry. This means that Tuck is completely safe to finish off Probopass with one last Liquidation. 
Fourth then is Cradley, who really isn't all that scary since her only rock type move is Rock Tomb, which is fairly weak for this point in the game. I start by switching to Roll as she sets up Stealth Rock. A little annoying, but it's a tad too late in the fight for that to matter much. A first impression on the next turn brings Cradley down into the red, as she just retaliates with an energy ball. And then a sucker punch on the next turn means that we can outspeed and finish off her last bit of HP before she gets off another attack. So, last is Olivia's Gigalith that's completely out of PP. We outspeed and hit a fairly hard liquidation before Gigalith does a squeak of damage that almost kills him due to recoil. The Sandstorm chip brings Roll under 50%, which actually activates her emergency exit, so it looks like Flick gets to come in and deliver the finishing blow after taking Stealth Rock damage. With an energy ball, Gigalith falls, and we've won the fight against the final Elite Four member. Ada was an absolute superstar in that one. We really couldn't have done this without him. With the Elite Four defeated, I can finally ascend the throne that gives me dominion over all of Alola. But right as I take my seat, ready to claim my championship title, Professor Kakui comes to tell me that there's one final obstacle I have to face. How is here to challenge my claim to the throne? And for that, he must perish. Let's finish this run once and for all. Hal very generously starts with his Alolan Raichu, so I lead with Roll. And then with the flick of our wrist, Raichu gets one shot by a priority first impression. What an amazing move. Second is Hao's horrendously ugly Snow Crab. He has Stone Edge, so it's off to Ada for a bit of light stalling. Well, not really. I mean, I do protect for a turn to gain back some HP with leftovers, because that's just being smart. But then, after somehow dodging yet another Stone Edge, I Volt Switch out to Hopper. And with Hopper safely out now, a superpower is enough to get the kill on the Goofy Ice type, though it does lower our attack and defense as a result. So third is Incineroar, and the plan was to let Hopper go down here to get a safe switch. But when it came down to it, I just didn't have the heart to let it happen. So instead, I hard switch to Tuck, who ends up taking a very nasty Inferno Overdrive Z-move. Even with Water Bubble, it does more than 50%. Leftovers heals a bit of HP, and we get a little more back by protecting on the next turn as usual. But Incineroar's Darkest Lariat does way too much damage on the following turn, like a crit would have just flat out killed Tuck. Since it didn't crit, we do get off a liquidation, but that unfortunately leaves Incineroar in the red. And I have no idea of how heals here, so I decide that I just have to stay in. And since he doesn't heal, Incin just stays in and kills Sweet Sweet Tuck with a Flare Blitz. It was always better to just let Hopper go down there and get a safe switch to Tuck. Fortunately, I didn't really get punished, but Tuck's death is really rough. Roll comes in to avenge her sister-in-arms with a first impression, so at the very least, Howe is down to just three Pokémon. He brings in Noivern next, so I go for a Sucker Punch for a chunk of damage. He then hits a nasty Air Slash that would have barely missed out on the kill if it crit. But this also activates Roll's Emergency Exit, which grants me a free switch into Molt. Since Molt can't be crit, we're able to semi-comfortably survive a Dragon Pulse on the following turn, and then kill Noivern with a Continental Crush. Fifth is Tauros, who gets off and Intimidate as he comes in. So I switch to Ada on a soft Iron Head. And then, you'll never guess how I deal with this physical attacker. If you guess Toxic, congratulations! Though Toxic is really only meant to do a little bit of damage so that we can finish Tauros off with one of my other Pokémon. After a few turns of tanking Earthquakes and racking up Toxic damage, I use Slow Volt Switch to freely pivot into Flick. Given her Levitate ability, a Hard Switch would have been free too, but I might as well get the Volt Switch chip damage if I can. Flick then tanks a Double Edge that once again would have just barely missed out on the kill if it crit. The recoil from the attack also leaves Tauros with a Sliver, so that lets my Zappy Bug finish the job with a Volt Switch and safely bring in Roll. This works out perfectly, as Hao brings in his sixth and final Pokémon, Leafeon. With a last impression, Roll takes out Leafeon in one shot, winning us the battle and the run. And just like that, my second ever playthrough of Ultra Moon comes to an end. I've learned a lot about Nuzlocking and content creation since that first playthrough of Ultra Sun over a year ago. So in a way, it was really cool to get to come back to these games and see how my playstyle and my content has changed. And as with most monotype Nuzlocks, it was fun to get to use Pokémon that I've almost never used before. Vikavolt and Galissapod have been popping off in my Inclement Emerald playthrough, but this was my first time using Rabombi, and I've always loved Araquanid's design but never had the chance to use one of them in a challenge run. So it was a blast to see Tuck do so well, all the way to the bitter end. R.I.P. buddy. 
ultimately, these games are still my least favorite in the franchise due to their sheer length and the tediousness of all the unskippable cutscenes and various side quests. I think that playing them any more than like once a year would be insufferable, but maybe we'll come back to this sometime in 2023. Who knows? Either way, I really hope you enjoyed watching the video. This one was definitely a long one, especially with the wipe, so if you stuck it through to the end, all I can say is thank you so much for watching. And I mean at this point, you might as well go that one extra step to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And be sure to join the Flygon HG community discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.